Time for Mark's Murder Mystery Monday. Welcome to Mark's Red Rock. Murder Red Rock. Mystery Red Rock. Monday. Please welcome the mistress of Mark's Murder Mystery Monday, my better half, Courtney. Hi. Yeah. Hello. Courtney, what is the story you will tell today? The story that we're covering today is the Osage murders. And Which, this yeah, is the story that inspired the new Martin Scorsese film, Killers of the Flower Moon. So you and I were chatting and we thought this was very a very timely story. It is indeed. Yeah. I, has, did the movie come out? It's out. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's out. Oh, yeah. So, um, so the Osage Native American tribe. The We're answer, showing the yeah, territory. I'm showing you the ancestral land because I, I think that the context of how long they had been here in the United States, they were a tribe. Some reports have them dating back to 200 AD, but this was the ancestral land of this tribe. Now, the murders of these tribe members happened between 1910 and 1930. And there were roughly reported about 60 members of the tribe that were murdered, but some research shows that there are hundreds. The and, people who are listening, I mm -hmm. just want to describe the area that the Osage ancestral territory covers is southwestern Pennsylvania, all the way west through Kansas into eastern parts of Colorado, all of Oklahoma, all of Kansas, all of Missouri, all of Arkansas, most of Illinois, all of Kentucky, and half of Tennessee and the southern half of Wisconsin. That's an immense area. Millions of acres. Yeah. And they had been there since, uh, I guess I mentioned, and this is through various types of reporting, but from like 200 AD I was reading. And in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase, the government started to come in and forcing, they started to force out the Osage tribe members. I have read different reports of what happened where they ultimately um, founded their current reservation, which is on the right hand side if you're watching. If you go to the next slide, it shows the context of like the diminishing amount of land that they had based on the federal government. Now, I had read reports that they, in fact, sold their land to the government and bought their current reservation land from the Cherokee Indians. But I have also read reports that they were forced into Oklahoma as the government was trying to create statehood around Oklahoma. And in that, they gave the land to the Osage tribe, or that's what they, they designated for the Osage tribe. And the Osage tribe members negotiated at the time both ownership of that land, but everything below the land. So any mm. minerals or anything that was found below that land. And certainly then, if you go to the next slide, in 1897, oil is struck. So um, Phillips Petroleum is an example here that you can see. They find oil there in 1897. And by 1920s, with World War I and the proliferation of automobile technology, oil is a huge commodity and resource that, the, uh, that America is using. And so in 1923, actually, the tribe members um, make $30 million that year, which would be $400 million in sort of contemporary inflation rates or you know, yeah, money. Yeah, kind of, right. Um, and so there and was a huge up, amount of money coming into the Osage up, uh, tribe. And it's split up amongst uh, how many Osage tribe members are there? Yes. So... There were 2,200 tribe members at the time when the land was given. And each tribe member gets a head right, as they call it. So it's an inheritance to whatever came from the profits around any sort of land ownership, but also the licensing of that land for the refining of the oil and mining of the oil. Um, this shows an example of uh, Pahaka, which is the city in the Osage County, or the town in the Osage County. On the left-hand side is the town in 1906. And on the right hand side is the town in the 1920s. So you can see how much money was coming in and how much this town was being built up by this influx of wow. money that was coming from the oil. Wow. Yes. A, a lot of the Osage tribe members were building mansions. So I have an example here, if you're watching, of different mansions, homes being erected, and sort of these contemporary furnitures, 
best of the best of what was available. The Osage tribe members became the wealthiest people on the planet per capita at the time when the oil, yeah, started to wow. <laughs> be leased out. Yeah. I have this uh, visual if you're watching. Um, it was said that there were on average one in every 10 or 11 households had an automobile in the 1920s. And the Osage tribe members had on average 11 automobiles each Jeez. to give you some context. Now, I have this because an important thing that I was reading in some reporting was eventually with the murders that started to happen, unfortunately, what was lost was not only those family members, but a lot of traditional ceremonies and things that were important, aspects that were important to the heritage and the culture of the Osage tribe members that they still tried to practice, which you can see on the right hand side. But in fact, there were so many lives that were lost that a lot of that is still affecting contemporary times within the tribe. Was the there was an attempt to maintain traditions despite the fact that there was this huge influx of wealth, as you're saying, yeah. they really did try, but then you're saying after the murders, it was a, a just yeah. the tribe was so wounded and diminished completely. That, yeah, I'm saying know. a lot of that storytelling and the heritage was lost. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was very sad. So the murders, so the oil is found in 1987. Uh, the leasing of the land happens in like 19, starts in like 1920s. Uh, late 1910s. And uh, the government felt that the Osage tribe members could not manage their money by themselves. So they started to um, delegate um, guardians for each of the tribe members and their head rights so that those guardians could help them manage their money. I read somewhere that there were eight practicing attorneys in Pahaska with 8,000 um, people living there. And it was the same amount of attorneys that um, were in the capital of Oklahoma that had 140,000 people living. Just to give you context as to how many people came in and saw an opportunity to take advantage of and harm the tribe for this great influx of money that was coming in. One of those people was this gentleman here, <laughs> was a horrible person here, William King Hale. He was a cowboy from Texas and he had actually come into Indian territory and he had started his own ranch and he was working in and around the Osage tribe and had started to sort of create a friendly relationship with them. And then when the oil was found, he was really the mastermind of so many of the murders that happened. And what would happen with the head rights is there was only 2,200 that were given out or delegated to the tribe members. There were not going to be any more head rights. So to inherit the head right, which would give you a portion of the profits that were happening from the oil leases, uh, it had to be inherited or delegated from the person that had the head right. So he, in fact, would befriend a lot of the Osage tribe members. They started to die. He started to inherit those oil rights. Because he, through marriage, was able to inherit He, through it. marriage, and also through illegally having them sign paperwork, illegally representing that the rights had been given to him. Through those means, he started to collect a lot of the head rights and the money. Weren't there people who were assigned to kind of protect Osage Nation from just this kind of exploitation that you're describing? Yeah, the guardians, but they were the ones that were perpetrating it. There were some guardians and there were some people that were, in fact, helping the tribe. Um, but for the most part, they were taking advantage of them. And he was sort of the ringleader, if you will. He actually signed his name, Reverend William King Hale, even though he wasn't part of any sort of ministry. He just felt that he was that level mm. of, of sort of giving and sort of the king of the Osage territory. Sure. And in fact, had anointed himself that. So if you go to the next slide, he um, has a nephew and that nephew is named Ernest Burkhart. Now, I should mention William King Hale is played by Robert De Niro in the film, and his nephew is Ernest um, Burkhart, and he's played by Leonardo DiCaprio. So, on the left, if you're looking on YouTube, that's the two of them. That's the two of them. So, okay. this is Molly, who is the tribe member, Molly Burkhart, and mm -hmm. she marries Ernest Burkhart. 
and I think he was a driver or something. And he, she just sort of fell in love with, with who he was and the support that he was giving to her on the right hand side are their two children's children, sorry, Elizabeth and cowboy. Um, and apparently I, I read both that Molly and cowboy cut off the head of every single photo of Ernest after wow. it was found that he was found guilty. But th those are in fact, the, the two kids from this marriage. So they get married and Ernest is helping his uncle murder Osage tribe members and ultimately kills off Molly's entire family and then tries to kill her. So if you go to the next visual, this is Molly's family. So these are Molly's sisters. Um, on the left-hand side is a photo of Molly's sisters and her mother. On the right-hand side are Molly and her sisters. If you go to the next uh, visual, there's another photo of all of the sisters together. All of the sisters were murdered. Um, and if you go to the next- Murdered uh, how? I'll tell you, if you okay. go to the next okay. slide. So um, this is Anna. Anna was um, very free, really enjoyed the money, really uh, sort of had a wonderful, exciting lifestyle that, that she sort of chose to live. And uh, she was murdered in a ravine and they said that she drowned, but she was shot twice in the back of the head. So, but because William Kale Hill was so important in the, in the town, um, ultimately, the people that were um, doing the autopsy on her body claimed it was drowning. Basically, they were covering the murders up. If you go to the next slide or the next visual, uh, this is her sister Rita. This is Molly's sister Rita. Her house was blown up by a homemade bomb that was instructed by William um, King Hale. So her Molly's sister died in a bombing of the home, as did her kids and um, the woman who took care of the house. Her husband ultimately died shortly after, Rita's husband. And if you go to the next slide, yeah. So um, I don't know how Minnie was killed. I did not read about how her third, or her third sister was killed. This is a lineage of William K. Hale and the relationship that he had within the Burkhart family. And um, well, I'm, I'm saying Burkhart, that's her married name, but you can see how the different lines of inherited um, head rights were ultimately coming in and profiting uh, William K. Hale. So wow. you can see Molly and her sisters are on the right hand side. The mother mm -hmm. Lizzie is on the far right. And then Molly's former husband, Henry, who was shot, uh, his entire um, head rights went to William K. Hale. It looks like Hale has a piece of everything. Yeah, a piece of everything. Exactly. So if you go to the next visual, and as you mentioned, the tribe had a lot of influence because they had a lot of money. So when these murders start happening, they go to D.C. and they talk to the um, the president and they hire um, different um, in, uh, investigators to look at the murders. And those investigators lobby, lobby the federal government to do an investigation. And so I think it's in 1924, J. Edgar, J. Edgar Hoover gets involved with the Bureau of Investigation. It was not yet the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And so if you go to the next slide. So J. Edgar Hoover gets involved and then he hires a man named Thomas White. So if you go to the next slide, I believe it's Thomas White. And then it's a photo of Thomas White and J. Edgar Hoover. Mm. And Thomas White starts to investigate the murders. And he actually does a lot of undercover investigating. He becomes the face of what is happening. They called it the reign of terror, but he had a lot of undercover um, people working for him and sort of befriending the tribe and befriending the people that were murdering the tribe and collected a lot of evidence. If you go to the next slide. So they ultimately find enough evidence to arrest um, William King Hale, and then also Ernst, Ernest Burkhardt. Ernest Burkhardt eventually admits to the crime. And he says, and he then um, tells the story of how his uncle has come up with this entire plan to murder all of these tribe members and take the head rights. So he incriminates his uncle. Um, he's tried in, in that courthouse, actually, that's just above what is still in Pahuska. So this courthouse still looks over the town that was such a 
horrific thing that just damaged this tribe for generations to come. So he's tried, he is found guilty. He's sentenced to a life in prison with hard labor. He's paroled and get this, he's paroled in 1941. I think he goes to jail in the late 1920s. He goes and robs the home of his former mother-in-law, Molly's mom. And he goes back to jail in 1941. Wow. He's then um, paroled later in his life and he ultimately dies in Arizona. Yeah. Jeez, what a craven, and I know, awful guy. I know. And if you go to the next slide. Yeah. So this is a picture of him later in life. This is Molly Burkhart. Molly uh, was being poisoned by her husband the entire time. She did not die of that. Her priest advised her not to eat or drink anything that uh, Ernest was giving her. And she lives until 1936 and she dies of unrelated causes. And her head rights are inherited by her family. Oh, that's mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this is a graveyard that is in Pahaska that has Molly and all of her murdered family members. What's really awful about this graveyard and the other graveyards in and around the Osage um, County and, and, and tribal land is that you see this huge amount of burials in 1923 and 1924, and they're very young. And so without any context, you would go into this graveyard and you would see this huge amount of people that had died um, and it, yeah, it would be, it would be out of context, right? Cause it's just, uh, such a grave and injustice thing that happened to that tribe during that time. It started with like a creep, it seems. And then it just turned into like this kind of wanton, you know, yeah, almost unapologetic, I mean, uh, elimination of everybody who was really with the tribe. Yeah. I'm focusing on the Burkharts cause that's what the film is focused on. But again, 2,200 tribe members hundreds of hundreds of them probably died as according to, to it research. was the same plan mm -hmm. the same template sort of being followed yeah. by a lot of different people who and, were working their way into this wealthy tribe and even and and those that weren't murdered still had mass fraud you know uh perpetrated, perpetrated them. against yeah. them yeah so it was just it's a horrific story and i have not seen the movie but um there is a lot of research out there there was a book that was written by a New Yorker reporter, and that book was ultimately made into the movie. Yeah, it's funny. Somebody was saying in our chat that the book is particularly good. Oh, um, wow. Well, the author has a lot of really interesting information and photographs on his website. So if you're interested, I I would encourage people to, to go there and find out more. I was interested in understanding what the title of the movie meant. Uh -huh. So I looked into that and... During May in Oklahoma Hills, blooming flowers die when taller plants, plants crowd them out. And so the Osage refer to that month as the time of the flower killing moon. And in fact, Anna, who is Molly's sister, who died in the ravine from the two gunshots to the head, she died in May. So there's some sort of comparison to, to that time as well. So that's, in fact, the title of the book in the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, in the chat, now there it is, the movie. Um, that's De Niro and, and you're saying that DiCaprio role is the, is the Ernest. guy of Ernest who yeah. you describe who, who made his way in. He's not a good guy. He's not a good guy. Uh, he's really after he, he admits to everything and he incriminates his uncle, but later in life, he, um, he really takes it all back and sort of says like, I was just a go between between my uncle and the people who are actually murdering the tribe members. But he did in fact kill people and he tried to kill his wife. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. It's it, a, it, uh, somehow I feel, uh, like the Osage story is going to be shorter than the cat story said, Colleen. <laughs> How dare you Colleen with that comment? Uh, Buck says, Mark, it must be very uh, comforting to live with a woman who spends the bulk of her time researching death. <laughs> It's uh, true. Mark sleeps with one eye open. Yeah, it's uh, but uh, really, really impressive. Oh well, um, you. Was, uh, I know you worked very hard to prep. I it. worked very hard to prep it. It's yeah. a very. I. It's a. It's a terrible story. I mean, it, it, uh, so it, much of our history is awful as it relates to Native Americans and among other people. But sure. uh, 
it was a, a truly horrible story. And I did not know about this story. I, you, you made the recommendation, and I appreciate you sending it to me. Well, no, I mean, very well, uh, well reported and uh, recognized as such. Uh, Courtney, everybody. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you. Thank you for having That's me. That's Mark's Murder Mystery Monday for today. Mark's Murder Mystery Monday on the Mark Thompson Show. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.